everyone and hello Elizabeth, thank you so much for joining me today for the latest interview in the A Spotlight On series. Today we are joined by Elizabeth Thick, who is a microbiologist and a scientific integrity consultant. So Elizabeth, if you can just introduce yourself and tell everyone a little bit about what you do as well. Sure, so I'm Elizabeth Bick. I originally did my PhD in the Netherlands, uh, moved to the United States and have lived there now for 20 years. I've worked 15 years of those 20 years at Stanford as a microbiologist doing research on the microbiome of people and of dolphins. And um, about uh, two and a half years ago, I quit my job. I also worked a little bit in startups, uh, but I quit all of that and I turned what was my hobby into my uh, new job, which is looking at scientific papers and looking for misconduct, looking for things like plagiarism, images that have been duplicated, photoshopped, things like that. So that is now my new job. I earn some money by consulting, uh, but I do most of my work as a volunteer. So how did your career in academia f first begin? Where did uh, that kind of... Yeah, I guess like most careers in academia, I um, did my PhD uh, at the, national, uh, the Dutch National Institute for Health and the Environment. And I worked on Vibrio cholera, which is the bacteria that causes cholera. And uh, yeah, worked on the molecular identification of different strains. And um, then did a short postdoc in that same lab. And then I moved to more the clinical side of microbiology. So I worked in a, in a hospital, setting up a molecular lab, trying to see if we could um, identify different strains that different people were infected with and sort of doing detective work, seeing if they were infected with the same strain so that if one patient maybe had contaminated another patient. So worked on that for about four years and then moved to the United States, um, did first a postdoc and then a sort of a staff position at Stanford for 15 years. And then I worked two years in, uh, in biotech. And how did you become a scientific kind of integrity? consultant and and also what exactly kind of is that just for our audience if they don't know what that is <laughs> well there's not many of us um so i am a consultant so you um i'm mostly hired by publishers or so scientific uh publishers or um uh universities who want to do an investigation on uh, a set of papers or a particular researcher that has been suspected of misconduct so I would serve as a, an expert witness or something like that, where I can, I can look at images that have been published and compare them, for example, with original images that a university or a publisher might have obtained and see if the, if the originals match the, the published ones or see if there's duplication. So I will, I will be hired by one of these um, institutions um, as, an, as an expert a uh, person who can look at these images and then I can write a report and that helps these publishers or universities to make a case or to dim dismiss a case that maybe there was no evidence. So could work yeah. both ways. And so I started this work by uh, sort of as a hobby. I, I heard about plagiarism, uh, heard about image duplication and just started to look for it. And by a series of coincidences found several examples and, and um, yeah, that, that became my hobby for, for many years before I quit my job. Yeah. And if, if we kind of take a step back, why is scientific integrity so important? I know that may be like a, a silly question, but I think it'd be good to kind of get, get your opinion on, on what the answer is to that. So for me, science is about finding the truth, finding what is going on in biology or in chemistry or whatever field we work in. And we scientists are doing experiments and measurements and will report upon that in scientific papers. So if, um, and then other scientists will base their work on those papers. So whenever we start a new research project, we'll look at previously published work. So if, if one of those papers contains false data, fake data, data that didn't happen, or even if it contains an error, that means that other scientists might waste a lot of time trying to reproduce that. So for me, science is a is this continuum of, of published papers and, and, and we, we need to make sure that these published papers are as close to the truth as possible. So I care about science integrity because it might waste a lot of other people's work if, if we don't care about that. Yeah, and I, I wrote recently something about, it was about a paper and it was talking about mice and it was saying that 
the way that scientists write their papers is then how journalists write their papers. So say if you're saying you've made a, a great discovery um, and then you leave kind of, you don't leave the fact out that you've done it in mice, but you kind of push that, play that down a little bit, then journalists are going to do the same thing and therefore the public are then going to obviously think that. And it, I feel like it is just kind of a massive knock-on effect if the science and, and how it's written isn't, isn't accurate. But, but you started a blog in, in 2014 called Microbiome Digest. What made you kind of set that blog up? So that is about my, my work as a microbiologist. So uh, Microbiome Digest, I set that up as a, uh, it started first internally. So I worked in a lab. We all worked on, on the microbiome of animals or, or humans. And there was, it was just a new field. So there were lots of papers coming out. And I just felt overwhelmed sometimes by all the papers. If you just did a search for the word microbiome, there was so many papers. So I sort of sent, started out sending emails to my coworkers like, oh, I think this is a paper that is you should read that just fits your research. And, and, and you should read that paper. I, I don't know. I, I just thought that was helpful. And it turns out other people found that helpful. And then they said, why don't you send this out? on a larger scale to all people working in the microbiome field and sort of curate these papers. And so I started doing this in a blog form, uh, yeah, curating papers on plant microbiome or on, on uh, environmental uh, microbiome and, and curating, sort of picking out the pearls and, and the nice papers that I thought would be worth sharing. And so this, this was the blog, it turned into a daily thing. And uh, now it's being run by a team of volunteers. So I don't run this myself but I also run another blog which is science integrity digest that is the blog that focuses more on my science integrity work so I have two blogs both digests and um yeah they they're uh, the, the science integrity digest blog is the one that, that I run myself on topics of science integrity that I've worked on and when did you kind of set that up and what was that kind of process like for you setting that up as well um, so the microbiome digest I set up in, what was it, 2014, um, the science integrity digest I set up in 2019, uh, around the time that I quit my, my regular job and started to focus on science integrity as my career. And I just wanted to write um, about the cases I had worked on myself, so I didn't really, it's not really a digest in terms of what happens in the world, because most of that is covered by Retraction Watch, and I didn't really want to interfere with that because that's a great blog I wanted to focus more on my findings on particular sets of papers that um, you know I posted on sites like Papier or discussed maybe on Twitter but to make it findable for all people who are not on Twitter or who not really follow other blogs so yeah sort of a site where I summarize my work on on, on the different cases what was that like for you kind of quitting your job like what made you finally go okay no I'm gonna I'm gonna quit this and I'm gonna, I'm gonna start doing this work what was that kind of that kind of process like so I worked in uh in a, a startup company about the microbiome and whenever I was talking about my my work in the startup and also my work as a you know my hobby as a, for working on science integrity I started to notice that I sounded a little bit more enthusiastic enthusiastic about talking about my hobby on science integrity <laughs> than about my real work I'm like well maybe 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 that's what I should be doing and uh you know you, it, it's it's was a little bit scary because I had a you know a stable income and so to quit that and become a consultant is a scary step because you you don't really know if that will pan out financially and things like that um so I did quit my job and um yeah, wish them all the best, of course. Uh, but yeah, started doing this full time. And because I had some Twitter presence, I, I felt I have had built up enough uh, of a reputation of working in this field that I could I could take this step and, and hope that some people would find me and hire me as a consultant. And they did. No, that's so, that's so exciting. Just to kind of like one day, like bite the bullet and be like, no, <laughs> and kind of like, and obviously that was your, your kind of like passion, as you said, like you were really, really interested in it. So that's kind of like really exciting. But what overall, what is the kind of current landscape of scientific misconduct and kind of photo manipulation? Like, I mean, how often is that occurring? Like, what are the types of things that people are doing? Like, if you can just give us kind of like an overview. Right. So when I started this work, I, I sort of had the same question. And, and I first focused on plagiarism. 
Um, and that, that seemed like a very tiny sliver of science papers because most scientific publishers will screen for textual similarities. There's of course, you know, stealing somebody else's ideas is, is very hard to detect actually. But uh, I was wondering how many, uh, how many duplications or, or maybe photoshopping type of jobs were going on. So I did a research, I scanned 20,000 papers uh, that contain the word Western blot. So that sort of enriches for papers in the molecular biology field that have Western blotting or immunohistochemistry. So it's a particular subset of papers, but they usually have photos. And I screened for those 20,000 and I found that roughly one in 25, so 4% of these papers had duplicated images within that paper, not even across papers, but within that paper, there was a problem. And, and so, I don't know if that means that one in, in you know, 4% of papers is, um, is, is, is bad, is, is fraudulent. Uh, some of these are, are errors, but um, so we estimated that roughly half of those, so 2% of all papers were uh, suggestive for science misconduct. But I actually think that the real percentage of misconduct is much higher than 2% because I, it's very hard to screen for papers that have um, fraudulent data in, let's say, a table or a sequencing data set or a line graph. It's very easy to do misconduct in there. If you do it with photos, it often leaves a trace unless you're a good Photoshopper. So I would guess that around 10% of papers contains science misconduct contains fraudulent data or yeah, falsified data uh, or faked data. So that's actually a very scary and high percentage because that's- Yeah, no, no definitely that's, that sounds quite Hundreds high. of thousands <laughs> of papers maybe even, yeah. <laughs> but how, so on a day-to-day -day you sit down, how do you kind of screen for these errors? How, how do you approach that on a day-to-day? On a -day? And say on average you were doing that, how often would you, would you find issues just in a single day? It's hard to say because nowadays I work mainly from tips that other people give me. And so those are already papers that somebody else thinks there's a problem with. So my, the percentage of problems I'm finding could be very high on a given day. But I've also worked on very complex sets where uh, the ones I've, I've just wrote a blog post about those are very complex sets that uh, were lots of money is in, involved because it was a company that is, um, you know, at the Nasdaq and there's people who buy stocks and, and there's, there's lots of money involved. So there you have to be very careful. And I could work on, on a case like that for a week. And maybe that's only five or six or 10 papers that I've found that are suspicious. But on other days, I found up to 50 problematic papers when I focus on one particular author who might have uh, duplicated their Western blots or their, uh, or has all kinds of overlapping photos. So I'm, I might have a, a really good day where there's, there's lots of um, duplications that I find, but most days I, I, I search and search and don't find anything. So, you know, it's, it, it depends a little bit on the data set that I'm working on. And you mentioned that obviously people can like approach you and, and kind of tell you um, that they think there might be some sort of like misconduct going on. How how do people go about actually actually kind of informing people that this is going on and getting you to kind of investigate this? It's it's through all kinds of channels. So I might get an email uh, from an anonymous group of persons who created a anonymous email account just for that purpose, I assume, and and say we're a group of worried researchers and we've came across this particular paper and we think there's a problem with it. Um, or I might get an email from a person and I can see who that is. And they say, we think this particular professor um, that you know, they, they, they're doing misconduct and can you check all of their papers? Or I get flagged on, uh, on, on Twitter. I get a poke, poke microbiome digest because we think there's a problem here. So through all kinds of channels, I might get requests to look at, at data and it's uh, either anonymous or I know who did it. I, I try to protect the identity of the people who flag me as much as possible. And I usually I will post things on a website called Hubpeer and just say an anonymous reader flagged you know, this paper for me and I agree with this problem. And here it yeah. is. Obviously this is not to defend people, but what are some of the potential reasons that people uh, might say 
commit scientific misconduct? What could be some of the potential reasons for that? It's it's all kinds of scenarios that I, I think might play a role. So I could imagine a, um, a person working for a bully, for a professor who says, I want these results by Friday. I want this PCR to work. Otherwise, I will fire you and I will hire another postdoc. And if you are a postdoc on a visa in a foreign country, then that is a scary thought. If you're, let's say, a person from India on a visa in the United States and you are fired from your job, that means that you don't have a sponsor and you have to leave the country within five days. I'm talking about pre-COVID, obviously. But um, those are situations where where people are scared to lose their job. And so uh, even if, if they have a family or you know, there's money involved in a salary, um, if you're in a situation like that, you will do misconduct because you feel that's, the only, that's your only option. And uh, I could also imagine a person who was extremely successful as a postdoc, did an amazing discovery, published in science or nature, then uh, got a, a, prof- a tenure track position, but then sort of switch their career, switch their research topic a little bit maybe. And, and then the research doesn't work. And we've all been there where, you know, we have these phases of big successes and then months or years of, of, of yeah, hard work, but no real uh, experimental data. So I think in a situation like that, where a person has tasted success, has published in science, and there's great expectations for this person to do really well, that I think might be another scenario where you could do, they, they could start to do misconduct. And um, there's also people who are forced to publish a paper. So uh, I'll give a very specific example of um, medical doctors in China. They need to publish a paper in order to get a position at a research, uh, sorry, at a, at a clinical hospital. So they are not interested usually in research. They want to help patients and cure patients. And that's what they, their education was all focused on. But now they have to publish a paper, yet they're not given time off to do research. They're not working in a research institution. There's just no way they can publish a paper. And so those people might buy a paper uh, because there's companies offering these people papers. And so those are what we call paper mills, companies or entities of some kind that produce papers and uh, fake papers and sell them to authors who need them. So it's usually all kinds of incentives or expectations that will drive people to do misconduct. I don't think there's there's a particular person who starts their career and thinks, I'm just going to cheat. I think most mm-hmm. scientists will start from a point of where they're really honest, but they just feel the only way out, the only way to get further in their career is by doing misconduct. I didn't know that these kind of types of companies exist like <laughs> I know it's, it's, like, it's crazy <laughs> it's organized crime almost um and and that yeah. is what worries me the most the, the these paper mills are pumping out hundreds or even thousands of papers that are hard to recognize they look surprisingly real and it's only when when those companies make mistakes like using the same figure twice or having overlapping images that we can find these papers but most of the times there's no no smoking gun there's no no just a suspicion that's a paper mill and it's really hard as a reader to know what is what is wrong with these these um papers or if they're real or not and only the publishers or the journal editors could then ask the authors can you provide some real data and in many of these cases the authors say okay just retract the paper and you just know like if this was a real paper, you would fight for your paper, right? You would, you would make sure that your paper is not retracted. You would provide all the evidence to show that this is a real paper. But these authors just say, oh, just retract the paper. So that tells me, yeah, these papers were indeed fake. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned that you're very kind of very active on social media and you have your blog as well. I think some people would argue that maybe these sort of types of things should be flagged internally directly to the journals and, and things like that. What would you say to, to people that kind of argue this this point of view? Right, I, 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 I can understand that point of view. And, and that is how I started this this hobby, this this work on science integrity. So um, initially, I did that scan of 20,000 papers, and I found around 800 papers with duplications. And I reported all of these to the journals. 
to the journal editors privately and um and then waited five years six years and after waiting so long uh, you would expect that all of these papers to have been taken care of but unfortunately only uh 40 percent of those papers had been either corrected or retracted and 60 percent so the majority of these papers had not been addressed so that's a lot of papers that have potential problems and that could still be cited and i wanted to you know, give the, the editors a chance to address these, these issues privately and, and ask for evidence. But I was frustrated that the journals didn't respond. And I actually care more about readers, other scientists who might cite these papers, who might base their research on these papers and wanted to alert them that there's a problem. So I've sort of switched. I still will report these, these papers to the ed journal editors or the publishers, but I will also flag them on Poppear because people can install uh, a plugin um, that will work with your, your literature searches. So if you do a literature search, you can see which papers might have a potential concern and you can, you know, base your, your future research on, on what Papier might tell you whether or not to trust that paper. So I, I care now more about the, the readers, the other scientists, than I care about the, the, the you know, the privacy of, of trying to resolve this matter um, you know, behind the screens. I, I feel this needs to be shouted from the rooftops. And, and that's the only way to, to almost force journal editors to take action. It feels like when you try to address these things privately, they don't feel the need to respond. When you flag things on, on, on uh, Twitter or Papier, it forces them to take action. And it, it's really based on what I've done in the past. I, I didn't start this way. I tried to play it nice, but yeah, I, I sort of gave up. That plugin sounds like really, really useful as well, like the one that you mentioned. Right. Um, obviously, one of the kind of prominent things that you've kind of been involved in in, in the past um, year has been a blog that you wrote analysing a paper that essentially said that hydroxychloroquine was effective in treating COVID. And obviously, since then, there's been loads of evi evidence to suggest that it's, it's not effective in treating, um, in impacting COVID severity or the likelihood of death. Um, what kind of happened during that process? Because they've obviously, the authors of the paper have kind of filed a complaint to a prosecutor against you, like kind of, kind of what, what, what happened? What went wrong? <laughs> well, so, so I wasn't, you know, pro or anti hydroxychloroquine per se. I just thought this, this study, this particular study that had been tweeted by President Trump and so was suddenly world news and a lot of people you know, try to get hydroxychloroquine because they believed it was the, the wonder drug against COVID. And this was, you know, March last year, where at the start of the pandemic, nobody really knew what to do, it was panic everywhere. Uh, how, how can we solve this? So uh, this was world news, literally. And um, yeah, so I just thought this study was poorly set up, um, very small number of patients, had all kinds of flaws where particular patients who, who did not do well on hydroxychloroquine was were left out of the study so there were all kinds of red flags so i wrote my blog post and obviously the authors of the paper were not pleased with me and i can totally get that so they called me out some weird names on, on twitter uh, and in the french senate but in the meantime i i looked at more papers from this group and since i specialize in images uh, and duplications i just screened a bunch of their papers for image duplication uh, and found several papers with severe problems of signs of yeah signs of not just duplications not just errors but signs of perhaps deliberate yeah manipulation of photos and so i posted all of these on twitter and um, i also found a bunch of papers with problems with ethical approval so all kinds of problems with this particular research group so in total i flagged i think 60 papers of that group on papier and so they got 60 emails from, hey, at least Vic had a comment on your paper. They did not reply to, to these uh, concerns. Um, some, some of the papers got some replies, but not, not from the, the, the big professor names. And so, yeah, they did, they did not really reply. And, and most of these concerns could be taken away by showing original blots or showing approval numbers, but yeah, they didn't reply. Instead, they filed this complaint against me for harassment and, and blackmail and things like that. Um, so this is a 
complaint that was filed to the prosecutor in Marseille, which is where this research group works. Um, yeah, and 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 it's still, I, I I'm not quite sure what stage this complaint is in. If it will turn into a lawsuit or not, I hope obviously not. But like, uh, yeah, instead of answering the scientific questions, they threatened me with a lawsuit, and I think that means they don't have answers to my scientific questions. And um, yeah, so it's still unknown what will happen. I don't think if the prosecutor will drop the case, they will tell me, obviously. So they, they, they like to keep me not in the know. And I think it's just a way to, to threaten me, to try me, to, to, to try to silence me. And uh, yeah, I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't let them silence me because I kept on searching for more papers and finding more. What has that been like for you? Because I suppose that's like really, really scary, especially when you're just kind of trying to do your job and you are looking at scientific integrity, like you're not doing something that's meant, you're meant to be like trying to be malicious or anything like that. Yeah. And like, obviously, like I've seen that you have received quite a lot of like abuse online and kind of what's that been like for you? You're just kind of doing your job, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's scary because I think I just raised some legit concerns about papers, which again, could be easily solved. And I had not expected this to turn into a lawsuit or a threat of a lawsuit. So that was very scary. I'm not employed. I don't have a big name university with a big legal team that can help me. Um, so I would have to, you know, hire a lawyer and, and probably, you know, lose a lot of money just trying to defend uh, myself. And um, luckily there was lots of, uh, lots of support that I got from people online. I think this is one of the advantages of having a big Twitter account is that you'll also have a lot of supporters. And usually the people who are, negative who are critical will uh, make more impact and, and obviously will make me sad because I did have some sleepless nights and some some uh, you know questions questioning myself should I continue this but I thought no I should continue this because I, I do think I have asked the right questions I try to remain polite I did not insult anybody I just raised some questions and instead they're insulting me and threatening me with me with a lawsuit so I, I think I know I'm right I know I'm right and I will keep on doing what I do and so luckily I had lots of support from other scientists there were two petitions with hundreds of signatures who of people who were supportive of me but it's usually the negative comments on Twitter that will somehow count more than the positive comments but I did get lots of positive comments as well I think that's the case for kind of everyone like you hear one negative comment and compared to like hundreds of positive comments and you always kind of remember that exactly. that one kind of yeah. negative comment but what do you think needs to be put in place for people who who kind of are raising the these sorts of issues because you are just asking questions you're not obviously trying to accuse anyone of anything like you just essentially want want answers um to to the important questions that you have what do you think needs to be put, put in place because as you said there's not there's not many of you out there kind of doing this doing this work and most of us are doing this work anonymously so I'm one of the few people who do who does this under their full name and so that makes me very vulnerable for for lawsuits but I also think it's important because I can talk about my work and I did do get a lot of support while the anonymous people who work really hard behind the scenes don't get those words of encouragement. So it's you know a decision I've taken to become public and, and to write these blog posts under my full name. But yeah, it also makes me very vulnerable. I'm not sure how to solve this. I think there should be some like anti-slap type of law and which we have in California where I live. So in, in California, if you try to sue somebody, you know, just to try to silence them, sort of raise this fake lawsuit by having fake arguments in an attempt to intimidate the person who criticized you. There are strong laws in California uh, against that. And I'm not a lawyer at all, so I hope I say this right. But I hope that other states or countries will have similar laws like that because, um, yeah, that we need, I think this work needs to be protected. It's sort of whistleblower work, even though I'm not an internal whistleblower, I'm sort of an external whistleblower these works need to be protected. And as long as I raise valid concerns and I don't insult people, I should not be have to be afraid that I'll be sued. And 
I'm not sure, again, I'm not a lawyer, I'm not sure how to solve this, but I hope there will be stronger laws and more support for scientific uh, whistleblowers to, to protect their, um, yeah, the, their right to ask questions and not be sued for that. Yeah. And how do you think we can improve scientific integrity as a whole kind of within the within the community? Because obviously that's where that's where it begins. Um, as you said, like some of the examples that you had, like how can we prevent it happening in, in the first place? Uh, I, I guess part of it is driven by the, the culture that we have as scientists that we need to publish. Like we're so counted held accountable for the numbers of papers and the impact factors and i think that that is part of what drives science misconduct we we feel this urge to publish and to have positive results and uh, so i think part of it is we need to we need to have smaller pu publishable units where if you've done a couple of experiments and and the results are negative there's no grandiose positive pcr band or there's there's, uh, you know, the drug doesn't work. We need to have better ways of publishing that, those results as well. So have more journals be acceptance of negative results, not just focus on the shiny, beautiful results, because there's a lot of research that ends up in the trash can uh, because it doesn't, re yeah, doesn't yield anything, but it's worth sharing so that other people don't have to repeat these experiments and trying to uh, replicate it. So I would be in favor of very small, publishable units where you can just publish one particular figure and then other people can comment on it and replicate those results and where replicating other labs results would would count towards your resume in some way I, you know like you get bonus points for that or so and and that's a completely different way than scientific publishing now is which is focusing on really big studies with lots of figures that are once they're published, nobody really seems to care about reproducing them because you it doesn't count towards your resume if you've tried to replicate somebody else's results because it's not publishable, because it's not new and it won't be accepted by another journal. So scientific publishing focuses too much on positive and novel results, doesn't focus at all yet on reproducibility. And I feel there needs to be more focus on that. Uh, in general, I think there's already enough policy at every university teaching people about what cannot be done. I think uh, there's way too many of these classes that we all had to had or have to take. There's, there's a lot of overhead, a lot of people working on these things. There's lots of uh, websites with um, regulations and, and PDFs and, and expensive words like stakeholders, which I don't quite understand. Like, but I think we need to focus more on real life examples and on solving these cases because I've seen many universities with beautiful PDFs and guidelines about research integrity and whole websites dedicated to that. But when I write to them, first of all, I cannot find a contact person how, whom to write to. Then I write to, to somebody at the university, I don't get a reply. Or I get a fake reply and then I hear years of nothing. So it's nice to have all these beautiful uh, regulations and classes and courses and certificates set up at a university, but we need people to who act upon my allegations or other people's allegations. And there's too much protection of big name researchers at universities uh, where the research integrity officer doesn't want to rock the boat or you know tries to silence the whole thing. And um, there's too many conflicts of interest. So I, in general, would hope for a more international or, or maybe countrywide research integrity institution that could investigate these cases without having to worry about things like people who make a lot of, who, who uh, get a lot of grants for universities or getting rid of these conflicts of interest and having independent organizations investigate these cases. Yeah. One of the points you you, meant, you said earlier, which I think is so funny, is obviously kind of about people trying to, people only get their results published if they're like really, really exciting or like new or like they've worked. But I find it really funny because when you when you become a scientist or whatever, everyone knows that most experiments don't work. And I feel that's kind of a universal thing between scientists that everyone kind of knows that most experiments you do don't work. So as you said, like, I don't know why more of these kind of results where it's not worked kind of don't get get published more because you are doing the work. It's just sometimes it just is not successful. Right. But, but what do you kind of think about the whole kind of peer peer review process as a whole? Like, how can we improve that? Because obviously things are getting reviewed 
they're getting published and they have all of these kind of like errors and manipulations in them so that's quite concerning obviously right so and i don't think peer review uh, always can catch misconduct in, in most cases it cannot and and peer reviewers are not you know they're volunteers who dedicate a couple of hours to peer review somebody else's paper for free and they're not really they know don't really know what to look for to to detect misconduct so uh, there are several ways of, of improving that process. I think having a tick box on your peer review form that you fill out after you've peer reviewed your paper saying, um, I don't, I, I've seen cases, or, I'm suspicious of some of the data here, um, or I think there's no sign of misconduct. I think having that box will help people look at the paper, you know, another, give it another five minutes and, and think about it from a different perspective. That might catch some of the problems in figures, for example. Um, but in general, it's 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 really hard to detect that. So I, I do try to educate people on Twitter by giving lots of examples, and I think that make be, will make people more aware of, of what to look for. Um, but in general, you would hope that more that publishers would have staff, educated staff, who can just screen papers for these these type of um, things, like they already do for for plagiarism. They have automated screens for that. Um, yeah, so there's there's lots of improvement. I also think that peer review for me personally is getting harder and harder because papers are getting bigger and I feel no longer qualified to peer review a paper and to peer review all aspects of a paper. So I'm still sometimes doing microbiome paper peer review and I can, I can uh, review parts of the paper, but there's other parts like statistical parts or particular clinical data that I just don't feel qualified to peer review. So I feel papers are getting too big, too multi-disciplinary uh, to, for one peer reviewer or two to completely look at a paper from all angles. So I wish there were smaller parts of a paper. I could focus on parts that I feel comfortable with. And um, in general, I do feel that peer review is a good process. Uh, maybe it should get paid because we do it all for free and then somehow the publishers make money out of all of this well we all you know i feel we scientists do everything for free uh so there's many things wrong with peer review but i also think we cannot abandon peer review completely because without that it would be a wild west and anybody can write anything uh and if you look at some preprint servers you will you will see that having no peer review in place will result in a lot of garbage being published are there any sort of kind of automated like algorithms that are being developed or, or exist that kind of are able to detect elements of kind of like the integrity and the things like that? Yeah, so there are, there are software to screen for textual similarities, so plagiarism. Um, but there's um, it's it's much harder to look for Im duplicated images. But people are working on writing algorithms and, and tools for to find that. It's still very hard and and not perfect but i've, I've worked with uh, two of these tools that look like um, they're doing good great job and they're not perfect yet but they're they're yeah they're, and they're not really yet ready as far as i know for prime time where you can just put in you know hundreds of manuscripts that come in at a publisher's desk and then screen for duplications but in the end they will give the example that, i mean it's all solvable this is just computational things which are you know still hard but I, I do think this will be solvable in the end and the advantage then is that we can screen for uh, manuscripts that are being sent to a publisher not just for duplications within that paper but also across all, all other papers that have been published so that is something a human could never do and I think that will find lots of cases where people are just reusing somebody else's western blot you know inserting them in their own paper or maybe you know, flipping them or rotating them a bit to make them look different and labeling as them as something completely different. I think that is very hard to scan for as a human. And I, I hope software like that can become commonplace at uh, publishers, um, you know, in the publisher's toolbox to, to, to scan all their incoming manuscripts for. Yeah, that'd be interesting to see. Um, what would kind of be the one message that you would give to someone who is kind of concerned about whistleblowing? 
Um, well, unfortunately, I would have to tell them that if they're early career, if they're a graduate student, for example, and they want to blow the whistle on suspicious things happening in their lab, maybe by their, their professor, that it's, it's probably not a good thing to blow the whistle because they will be fired. Unfortunately, this is the situation I've encountered too many times where a person did raise concern either with the professor themselves or with the, the dean of research or a research integrity officer at their institution. But their, the professor then got uh, you know, cleared of misconduct and the junior researcher had to leave because they were labeled as you know, hard to work with or you know, we're, we're, we're revoked access to the building or you know, weird things like that where they're just being bullied and, and, and sort of slowly uh, yeah, forced to, to, to res resign. And so unfortunately, if you're very junior, you have lots of, you have lots of things to lose and you have very little chance of, of winning the case of, of you know, being um, regarded as the person who's right. And when you are the big PI who brings in a lot of money, you will be protected by the university. And we've seen lots of these cases in the Me Too movement where you know, professors, certain professors were known to be sexual harassers and everybody sort of know it, knew it. Uh, these persons were reported multiple times and nothing happened. And, and, and so I feel lots of similarities to, to, to those cases. But um, uh, I'm always happy to screen papers once they're published, I can actually raise them on papier and raise concerns. But inside knowledge where a whistleblower just knows that a particular figure was manipulated, but it's hard to look at the figure from in the paper and know, you know, see it. Uh, there, I cannot really help them because I would expose their identity uh, because only an insider could know it. So I wish this was different. I wish I could tell people to, to report it no matter how junior you are, but that's unfortunately, it's probably going to turn out bad for the junior whistleblower. Um, but yeah, get out of the lab, I would say, if possible. But it's it's hard because you're, you know, it's it's such a um, hierarchical position to be a junior researcher. You need so much from your PI. Yeah, if you cannot, um, you cannot usually leave the lab and, and find another job. That's not how academia is set up. So it's it's tough advice, and I wish I could give it worded differently. Yeah. It's a sad time though. <laughs> um, thank you so much for joining me today, Elizabeth. It's, it's, been, it's been so great. And I think this, this work is kind of so important and often undervalued. And thank you so much for, for joining me and sharing your important insights. It's been great. Thank, thank you. you for having me on, Shannon. It was great to be here. Hello, everyone. If you enjoyed this video, then make sure you check out some of the other videos in our series by subscribing below or going to our website, frontlinegenomics.com. I hope you enjoy. <laughs>